Welcome to episode 14 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Friday, September the 5th. Uh, I'm Tony. With me this week are Alan. Did you enjoy your holiday, Alan? It was lovely, apart from being buried in the sand. Wearing your Ubuntu t-shirt? Of course. We're also joined by Laura. Laura, what are you doing here? I live here <laughs> and I'm filling in for Davy again. Oh, he's on holiday, is he? I think so. I got that knotted handkerchief back out. <laughs> and Simon, how was your trip down here? Oh, very fun. Had to pick Popey up from the train. It's a little bit wet out, isn't it? It is very wet. Glad Not you on didn't... the bike this time. Yeah, I was like, glad you didn't come on the bike, that's for sure. Excellent. So, what have we got in this episode? We have the news. Which is quite long. <laughs> we have a discussion on the free culture showcase, which Tony is involved in. We're going to talk about the Stephen Fry video that he made for GNU. We discuss the risks and rewards of running IBEX in alpha form. We're going to talk about the competition. And we've got your feedback. Britain's favourite clever guy, Stephen Fry, was asked to make a happy birthday GNU video for the Free Software Foundation. Um, In a somewhat awkward solo, Fry talks briefly about the benefits of free software and suggests GNUsense as an option for anyone looking to install free software. What do we think? It was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? It was very good, actually. It was an excellent video. I thought it was very nice. You sort of sit there going, that's Stephen Fry. (laughs) He's talking about geeky stuff that we do. (laughs) But do you like it because it's got Stephen Fry in it or do you like it because it's got free software or talking about free software? Well, it's the celeb factor, yeah. I mean, the fact that it's a, you know, celebrity of whatever, you know, level, you know, whether you're classing, you know, A-list celebrity or whatever, but, you know, it's someone who is well-known by the public talking about, you know, something that we try and talk to the public about all the time and probably doing it a lot better than we do. Do you think it was realistic? Do you think it was grounded in um, what our perceptions of the free software world are? I mean, talking about GNUsense as the best option for people to try free software. No, it's not. But I can understand why it was done the way it was done, because it's meant to be about free software. I mean, why, why do you think it's not? Well, because, as we've spoken about before, GNUsense, if you try and put GNUsense on your laptop, you're going to have issues. Like, li- like what like, kind of issues? Like, it won't have... Um, any non-free software on the distribution is that is that not a good thing that they would argue that you know you you don't want non-free software do you? you don't want binary blobs you don't want flash players and other rubbish wireless drivers that you can't fix <laughs> i want people to be able to use free software i don't want them to to miss the opportunity to use something other than the other operating systems because there is something that's not free on their system yeah it, it, if if the option is them using windows and all of the stuff that it tends to come with, versus them using, say, Ubuntu with a couple of binary blobs in it, you go for the Ubuntu option. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. And yeah, and mean, then if they want to get into freedom, you know, and be straight down the line, then absolutely. Once you've got your head around the new OS, then by all means, go and be hardcore freedom. They would probably argue that you would want to get, if you want someone to have free software, they're better off having the whole environment free. Yeah, the all of the software on their machine free so that in the event that there's any problem they can contact the maintainer of that free software and potentially get it fixed which is impossible if it's non-free software so it's all or more likely nothing yeah well yeah basically what about the sort of feel of the message i mean i guess or i believe that the free software foundation sort of essentially wrote the script and they got Stephen Fry along to sit in a chair and read it and blow out the candles on a cake. It did feel like that. It did feel like that, because yeah. they kept talking about GNU Linux. Now, Stephen's written about Linux and things on his blog and hasn't called it GNU Linux before. Yeah, but if he's a mouthpiece for GNU... On, on his own blog, he can say what he likes. But it, as when yeah. he's a mouthpiece of, of the Free Software Foundation and GNU, he obviously has to say GNU slash Linux every time. And it just feels a bit contrived to me as a result. Yeah, but you, you and I, and I would suspect some of our listeners tend to refer to Linux as Linux and tend to refer refer to Ubuntu as Ubuntu or Ubuntu Linux and don't refer to it as GNU slash Linux or Ubuntu GNU slash Linux or anything, you know, as as clunky as that. Mm. And so it does sound alien to us. But if you're trying to convince non-Linux people of what you're saying, then you need to be pragmatic and not be awkward and GNU slash Linux all the time. I guess they would argue that it's not awkward. It's It's giving people credit for what they've written. And, you know, the fact that this has been going how many years? 25 years now they're talking? Yeah. So it's been going a very long time and it's still going. And now they've got a distribution in GNUsense that you can put on some computers Mm. that works perfectly fine for some people in some circumstances. So 
it kind mm. of has worked for them, you but, know, in some ways better than us. But we we sort of know their arguments. We've heard we've heard them say, "Oh yes, well it's a it's a, a joint effort." And then we've heard Sun say, oh, "Well, we have more lines of code in an average Linux distribution than GNU do, so it should be Sun slash GNU slash." <laughs> and we've heard all the, the counter arguments, and we've been bored to tears by them at yeah. times. But it it and I can see why because it was a free software or GNU anniversary, it would be right to talk about GNU and to talk about you know its impact on in the in the Linux world or the free software world or whatever. But it was not a video that I would really want to show a non-Linux user. Yeah, I, I agree. Really? I actually, I, I try and convince my parent, uh, my, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law about Linux and, and Ubuntu and, and other free software stuff. And, you know, we, we talk about it on a, you know, semi-regular basis, given that I do this podcast and so the conversation comes up. Yeah. And they know who Stephen Fry is. You know, they've seen him on TV. They know, they know the history. And I actually, I agree with you. I wouldn't actually even show them this video. I might mention that Stephen Fry did a video, something to do with free software, but I would actually feel embarrassed about showing them that video. Yeah, I I agree. It just uh, it makes it me it make it to some degree it makes my skin crawl. So you're actually saying that it was a bad thing. <laughs> I think it's preaching to the converted. Yeah. I think the only people who are going to get anything out of that is. People like us, free software weenies, are going to go, ooh, ooh, look, Stephen Fry on the telly. And, you know, and your average Joe is going to go, what? What's he talking about? Plumbing? Uh, free software? <laughs> it's like plumbing. <laughs> what? This is it. Uh, my, my trouble with this video is that I really like Stephen Fry. I've read his books. I've watched him on TV for years. And I think he's really great and literate and clever and erudite. And he's reading not a terribly good script, I don't think. It's a bit clunky in places. And it just feels a little bit dirty. It feels like he's a little bit sold out, almost. He's lowered himself. Yeah, he's sold out. To free <laughs> if it had just been, if it just been him, <laughs> him in his flat and a video camera, going, "Hi, it's Stephen Fry, and I just wanted to wish uh, GNU and Free Software Foundation a happy twenty fifth birthday for you know reaching twenty five years of contribution to free software." Bam, lovely. Yeah, but if he'd done it himself in his own flat, he'd have done it with a Mac. He using... did do it with a Mac. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, using an Mac OS Mac te- next to him. I asked Mac Lee and he said that that Mac was running GNU Sense. It didn't show that. It was there publicising Mac Airs. <laughs> well, he said it was running GNU Sense. And, you know, I, I, I have no reason to doubt that. It just came across as like a really a little bit tacky corporate video. And it made me feel worse for Stephen and no better of the Free Software Foundation. Okay, so how could it have been improved? bit more relaxed bear in mind it's going to have to plate, be plate spinning <laughs> <laughs> you know, something, something entertaining well, to get the, the idiots who watch ITV you know watching they've got to know. do something to celebrate and how could they've improved it how could we I mean let's not just not go down the, the format route and all the releases and the licensing and stuff how could they have um, done it better I think someone should have someone professional a script writer should have written the copy if they didn't if they did then they should fire the script writer should they have just let Stephen in there with a decent camera and, and the setup and said, you know this stuff, crack on? No, because if he'd have done it, this is the point I was going to say about him being in his flat. If you'd have let him do it on his own, he probably would have done it with a Mac and used iLife or some other proprietary app. And the free software weenies would have blown their whistle and said, this is not allowed. You know, this is in H264 and it should be Og Theora, blah, blah, blah. But if it's just a video that he's made and is releasing, it's up to him what he uses. The only difficulty is if it becomes like a free software foundation endorsed video that it needs to be done on all the free software stuff. And somebody who has generated video on free software, I can appreciate the difficulties that that involves. Absolutely. And then releasing it under a potentially non-free license. Ah, ha, 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 ha. That was quite funny. Although, you know, the free software foundation don't release anything non-software under a fully free license. Everything's Creative Commons, no derivatives or similar licenses. So they're, they're only following their own track record. Mm. However, somewhat hypocritical, some might think that is. I don't know. It just seems like a really missed opportunity because you obviously got somebody who has got a public profile as a very clever person, Stephen Fry, who could have been saying great things that you in a video that you could show your relatives or your grand or whatever. So who would have been better? I'm not. I think Stephen Fry is the right person. I just don't think it was just, the right content. Right. Okay. So yeah, better script. Yeah. I mean, he did look a bit awkward, sort of sat in that chair as well. You know, maybe sort of you know, look at I don't know, jazzing it up, as you say, plate spinning or something like that. <laughs> Fire, that would have been good. Yeah. Well, he writes. I mean, he writes blog posts fairly, a lot more in a lot more relaxed way. 
And, I mean, he could have done a video on that level. Of yeah, we don't know the parameter. circumstances. I mean, it could well be that he was under a time pressure or yep. something. Who knows? We, you know. we can only judge on what was published output. Yeah. And, you know, that's our, our right, is, I guess. It is but our humble opinion. It is our humble opinion, <laughs> yes. And if Stephen wants to send me any books or anything, that would be great. Yeah, his uh, blog is uh, stephenfry.com slash blog, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our very own Tony has been recruited by Jono to help judge the Ubuntu Free Culture Showcase in which people are invited to submit audio and video files to replace the example content which was previously delivered in a standard Ubuntu system. Has anyone taken a listen and a look at what's been submitted so far? Uh, no. Good. No. Well, I have. And um, Tony, what do you think? Um, I haven't listened. I quite deliberately haven't listened to anything until the judging time comes so i see it all or hear it all fresh because there's audio and video submissions and what's the plan are you, are you just going to listen to them and then say yeah that's good and chuck it on the cd or how does how's that going to work i think you're attributing more planning to this process than i'm aware of um <laughs> well i'm not the only judge thank god who else is judging? um i think Corey and louis from um studio. up into studio yeah they're both judging and i think there's a couple other people as well um so that's good because I'm, you know, I'm really not sure why I was asked, but it's great. So that's fine. Um, so we're going to sit and listen to the uh, entries in our appropriate domiciles and uh, votes or something, I guess, to see which ones we want to make onto the CD. And if any of them are good enough and come up to muster, then they will get added into what people normally see in the examples directory or something. I think that's the plan, yeah, at the moment. So is this to replace the videos of Nelson Mandela? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay. It seems everyone kind of dances around the subject of the Mandela video because mm. I think there was a lot of effort made by Mark actually to get the video on there to get the video of Mandela right. and nobody really wants to ask Mark to get rid of it. Was it it's filmed especially for Ubuntu? I don't know. I don't it, know. it never mentions the Linux bit of Ubuntu. He's talking about Ubuntu, the word, and Ubuntu, the sort of the, the spirit. Do is we think is it a good idea? Is it a good idea to to? get people to put content on the CD or to, yeah. to offer out. Well, we talked to Pete Savage back in sort of one of the very early shows, didn't we? Yeah. And he was talking about how it was good to have ways that people who aren't programmers can get involved in the distribution, producing a good distribution. And it seems like a really good idea. If people out there who are using Ubuntu and are creative but not programmers, yeah, get some get some content on the CD that shows off uh, what you can do on Ubuntu to uh, to the best of its ability in the best light. Whether this showcase you know, proceeds to do that or not, we'll, we'll tell. Well, it's difficult because I think there's only been about a month or so uh, that this this competition's open, and I had a chat with Jono and and Corey about it, and they I think they'll do it again if if it's successful this time. Then they'll do it again for the next release and maybe have longer, so mm. people have more chance to to create their own their own stuff because i wouldn't be surprised if half of the stuff that's on the page and we'll put a link to it in the in the notes that go with the with the podcast i wouldn't be surprised if half of that stuff was created before the competition started you know it wasn't specifically created for this it may well be i mean i don't know because i've not contacted each of the people ind individually but... mm. i don't think there was a requirement for it to have been no but i mean i don't know i'm i, I think it should be I think it should be created uniquely for this. Otherwise, you know, anyone creating content could just go out and get their entire library and submit the whole lot. And there's no there's no requirement for them to have actually made a bit of effort to... I mean, they made effort in the first place to create it, but no effort to make it, you know, unique for Ubuntu. Or am I expecting too much? I don't know. If you've written the best song in the world and mixed it using Arda and free software three weeks before the competition opened... Would it not be reasonable to submit that if it was the yeah. best song in the world? And 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 then yeah, just after the competition opens, you have to go and sit down and you write something rubbish. Instead. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that's the only requirement. That the date that you created it was the only requirement. But you know, having a target of the Ubuntu CD, not not just you know, people create their own music at any time and their own videos at any time, and then you hear about this competition. Ah, oh, I made something three years ago. I'll just stick it in that competition. I mean, you... it's a means of getting it out there. Yeah, I don't know. Is that right? Or I, mean, I should... think um, it might be a bit restrictive, actually. Um, knowing a few arty types, putting them on the spot and say produce can be quite difficult. I think you should just open it up. You know, if you've got something, whether it's you know four weeks old or forty years old, please submit because mm. we want content. You put seven fifth on there. 
No, well, actually, <laughs> the, when the, this this was discussed um, at UDS a year ago, and um, I was in the room when we talked about this, and we specifically made sure that Jono was excluded from entering the competition <laughs> so that we could have none of his metal, Jono's world of metal on the CD. Oh, that sounds fair. I wouldn't have voted for it anyway. No, absolutely. <laughs> Just looking down the list, it seems to be the same people submitting several things, so there aren't that many in unique people entering. Yeah, and I, I guess it's difficult. I, I mean, maybe it's publicity of this of this competition. Maybe there wasn't enough. Yeah, sure, enough um, time, like we did. Yeah, and it wasn't. I mean, there were various options chosen. This was the one that was chosen was have a competition based on you know here rather than have a separate website or rather than go and ask a content provider like Jamenda or Magnitude rather than ask them. You know, and only get content from those providers, open it up to absolutely everyone. But opening it up to absolutely everyone with one month's notice has resulted in what a dozen people mm. submitting. Would we get more if it was if it if we went directly to someone like Jamendo and said, publicize this on your site and have a button on their site that says, submit your content to the Ubuntu CD? But then we're restricting it to only people who submit to Jamendo. So, you know, there's swings and roundabouts whether this is the right way of doing it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have liked to have seen um, a variety people submitting stuff or a wider variety of people submitting stuff than have done rather than lots of people submitting oh i've did this track i did this track i did this track you know submitting eight or nine tracks because firstly if it's all your stuff it's going to sound probably quite similar anyway and secondly if the small number of people who've submitted aren't all that good at what they do i'm not saying in this case because i haven't listened to them so i don't know <laughs> but if they are not keep digging no, no, no but if they turn out to be not all that good then we're in a little bit of a situation of going well do we stick stuff on the CD so we can say we've run the competition and that we have had user submitted content and isn't it great at the risk of it not actually being all that good on the CD for people who are listening to it for the first time? So what's worst case scenario? You either put rubbish content on the CD or you put and and say, well, that's what came out of the competition or you put none of the content on the CD and say, well, actually it wasn't up to scratch. Worst case scenario is, hello, I'm going to talk about Ubuntu. Leaving Mandela on the uh, video, is that what you're saying? <laughs> on the on the CD? Yeah, maybe. And it doesn't have to be um, rubbish. It's, it could just be that it's not suitable for this particular distribution. Yeah. I mean, if we had some really heavy, hardcore trance music in there, it's probably not going to... be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would be perfect for one person, and then for the next person it would be like, what the hell's this? This is, this is one of the big problems with the whole creativity thing, with, uh, you know, not just for the free, uh, the free culture showcase. Damn creative types. Well, no, not the creative types. It's everyone has an opinion. Like, you know, people keep bitching about, you know, this is a completely different subject, but related, the fact that Ubuntu is brown. Mm. I don't really care. I, mean, I leave it as brown on my desktop. And, but a lot of people really don't like it. And the same way that if you put a piece of music in there, there's going to be an awful lot of the population who just don't like it. And you can't keep everyone happy. But there's nothing forcing them to listen to it. To be fair, I have no time and to listen to them myself. And there's nothing stopping people changing their desktop from brown to some other colour. But people still bitch about it. Yeah, but I mean, at least the brown thing you see when you turn your computer on. Whereas I don't think, I think I've once been into the examples folder. And it's hidden away and don't need it. I don't need free culture, <laughs> says Laura. <laughs> now, I think it's a good idea to have them on the CD, partly because when you've installed, you can test out that everything's working. I think that's yeah, part, that's of, the, part of the, um, the reason for it being there, and that's why yeah. there's lots of different types of files in there, mm. is to test them all out. But we've, um, you know, we've mentioned the fact that we're quite limiting in that we've you know, limited it to a month. Why not just have a, a small repository where all of it can go? Ongoing. And I mean, yeah, absolutely, continuously rolling. I mean, who are mm. the judges to judge whether it is suitable? Oh, well, they're, well they're kind of, they're, there already is that kind of thing. There is already a repository. I mean, you've got things like, for, for graphics, you've got Gnome Look, Gnome Art, and, and Kubuntu Look, and things like that. And for audio, you've got Jamendo and you know, all the other audio things like Magnitude and so on. Mm. So th there already is repositories for this stuff. This is more tying it onto the CD. But I see what Simon says. I think it's actually got some merit as well because you could have a six-month rolling thing. You know, every six months you just say, "Well, what's come in the la in the last six months? Is any of it good enough to put on the CD?" Like the Ubuntu calendar, uh, a piece of content every month. I, I'm not familiar with the Ubuntu calendar. Yeah, I'll tell you about it later. Okay. Is it one of these things where it's had one piece of content in the last? No, it had eight. nude people. Oh. So inappropriate content. Or appropriate for some people. Oh, appropriate. For what some what is art? 
Absolutely. <laughs> yes. But, you know, yes, you could have a repository. The downside of that, if it's always open, people will f- perhaps forget about it, or you end up with the same four or five people always submitting all their tracks and other people not doing so I think no, I, I can see merit in that as well. I mean, having a thing that, you know, when I do my software updates, I get a new piece of music every month or something oh, yeah. just delivered, you know, based on a package that I subscribe to that was, you know, classical or rock or, you know, metal or whatever. And I get <laughs> a, a new track each month from this free software showcase. And definitely a good idea. I like that as well. It's a whole different project for that, isn't it? It could change your login noise every month. Oh, that would be, <laughs> that'd, that'd be Actually, That's a really good idea. Yeah, have a five minute you know symphony five, five minute five minute symphony <laughs> instead of the the special drums from pete savage ubuntu congo wasn't it the mozilla team have released ubiquity which is nothing to do with the ubuntu installer of the same name it's actually some kind of funky command line and toys for the browser what is all that about it looks like they're trying to put more content um, more easily into email and um, and the browser. What, like embed stuff? Like, yeah. So maps and, and yeah, other maps kind of... Yeah, maps and other content um, reviews and, and things like that. There's a, a fairly good video explaining it on the website. Dell are now shipping new mini PCs with Ubuntu or Windows in the USA uh, with the UK to follow shortly. At £269, they're 9-inch display laptops and they're competing directly with the likes of the Asus or Acer or MSI for the sub-notebook market. Yet more little PCs to play with. Hopefully they'll um, start driving the price down soon. They are down. And, well, and also, you know, it's a big manufacturer. It's not like, you know, MSI, who nobody had heard of before the MSI win. And they've actually got a proper Linux distribution on. Yeah, yeah, proper Linux, not Xandros that the Acer comes with, Mickey Mouse girly mode. It's proper Ubuntu. The Debian project is now offering a new beta live version based on Lenny, uh, which is the current version in testing. According to the news, the images are available for CD, DVD, USB sticks, tarballs and PXE netboot and SquashFS image. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, welcome to 2005. Oh, yeah. Well, no, it's 2008 and we haven't even got USB versions of Ubuntu yet. And I mean, you can force a CD onto it, but... That's pretty good, I think. But a live CD, woo. Who says we never give anything back to Debian? And MyTech and Commodore are also offering new ultra mobile PCs. You've got to do, if you get a Commodore, you've just got to put a Commodore emulator on there, haven't you? <laughs> Has it got the badge on and everything? With the yeah, logo? it's got the, well, I mean, obviously Commodore don't exist anymore. It's only the name, it's the name only. But it is the original logo. And they are quite sweet looking, they're white. Does it come with a floppy disk drive? Uh, not a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive, <laughs> no. It's no good then, it's not a Commodore. <laughs> I had a look for the uh, MyTech today, and they're actually shipping uh, what looks like a an SD um, GPS with it. Which is oh yes, it's a little, nice. uh, isn't it a little pop-out GPS thing? Something like that. Yeah, that's really cool. As if you didn't know already, Google's released a new web browser called Chrome, and it's based on open source technology, including WebKit. The browser promises to be faster, more secure, and easier to use than existing technology. And after getting some criticism for a somewhat dodgy end-user license agreement, Google's relented and it's now looking more acceptable. Has anybody tried it yet? Yep. In a VM under XP because the Linux version isn't out yet. Any good? Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's all right. It's a browser. You know, what's it going to do? Is make, it, make my coffee. Is it fast? Yeah. Even in a VM under under Windows, it's still pretty quick. Cool. And I quite like the, the home thing that's got... Uh, I think they ripped that from um, Opera but it's like got uh, thumbnails of the websites you visit most often. That's quite nice. Will the Linux version be out in time for Ibex? No. Launchpad now has mapping built in, so users can pinpoint their rough location on a Google map. Uh, and if they're in a team, then the team map shows their location along with everyone else in that team. Yeah, it's good if you're a team spread all over the world. You can see where geographically your people are, so if you're scheduling meetings and stuff, that's quite handy. Okay, I was going to say it sounds pointless, but I'll give uh-huh. you that one. So, uh, yeah, quite a lot of people did ask, what is the point in having this? And that's the only reason anyone gave. And why are they using Google Maps? Because uh, the answer that came on the, on the launch by mailing list was because for the guy who wrote it, there was no mapping in his area for OpenStreetMap. Get himself a GPS and sort yeah. it out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, can, we can put him through to some people who can help him with that. Yeah. In the last episode, we opened our competition for a Bitfolk VPS. I think it was £200 of credit, wasn't it? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, now, because we released the actual episode quite late, um, we've decided to extend the competition somewhat. So people have better chance because some people just don't listen to the podcast. We know they don't listen to them the day it comes out. And it's a little bit unfair if you listen to it you know, a couple of days after the competition closes and then you want to enter. Yeah. Basically, we're slackers and we didn't get the episode out quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how long are we um, going to extend it by? Um, we're going to keep it open till Wednesday the 17th of September. So essentially, that's another fortnight on and the re- original date. Remind us what the competition question was. The competition question was, which Ubuntu releases do BitFolk support as standard? And how can you find that information out? Uh, well, we should leave that to the uh, the listener, really, to go to bitfolk.com. Oops. Oh, what a giveaway. Once you've found the answer, you email it to competition at ubuntu-uk.org, not podcast at ubuntu-uk.org, and we'll draw the winner in the next episode. Guys, it's almost party time. Um, 30th of October, new releases out. Yay. Intrepid Ibex. Um, I've not made one of the release parties yet. It's in my diary. I'm going to be there. I think we should have it in the same place as we had the uh, Hardy one, actually. Yeah, I've heard it's really good. Cool. But um, that's a plan. <laughs> <laughs> that's a plan. That's See the there. important bit of it out the way. So, have any of you actually downloaded it and uh, installed it and see what it's like? Yes. No, not yet. You haven't? I have, yes. Excellent. Why is that? To test it and to make sure stuff works and file bugs if it doesn't. Okay. I, I bought a new hard drive for my laptop and because I was running out of space and I thought now would be a good time to part- partition it up so that I've got my normal partition that I use for every everyday stuff and then I added an extra 10 gig partition and that's where I installed the next release of Ubuntu that's not out yet and how does that work for you well I dual boot and what I tend to do actually is I not not use it too much because I've got obviously all my data on you know my one that I my partition that I use all the time but I reboot into uh, the other one and try and the Ibex and try and use it as much as I possibly can and yeah, you know, file the odd bug here and there. So do you use it for sort of day-to-day stuff, surfing the web, IRC, email? Yeah, what I would normally use with a PC. I mean, there's some stuff that I don't do on it that, you know, I haven't migrated across to it yet, which I could do. Like, you know, some of the more hardcore stuff like audio editing and video encoding and stuff like that, which I haven't started doing yet. But yeah, more day-to-day stuff. I mean, it's only got to the point now for me where it's working fully and I can, you know, use it. If the system is broken to the point where I can't even boot the thing, then there's no way I can do day-to-day testing of video editing and stuff like that. So, you know, it has to get beyond the point of being, you know, bootable and running and not crashing and that kind of stuff, which it is now. I've only ever run alphas as live CDs in the past. Um, if you install one on your system, what happens when the full one comes out? Do you ever have problems with getting the very, very latest last-minute things? Or do you have to reinstall the entire thing? No, I, I don't reinstall. I, what I what I tend to do is it, I'll install whatever the next release is, the development version, they call it, and I'll install off of an alpha CD or a beta CD, and then I'll just keep doing updates. And, okay. and those updates keep on coming and keep on coming. And, in fact, the great thing is on the release day, you don't have to do anything because you've got the final release. <laughs> have you not any issues with that? How do you mean? In that way of doing it, going from an alpha and just continually updating and updating and updating without doing uh, a fresh install when it's finally released. No. no? Because, the, the, I mean, arguably there may be some craft kicking about, but it's pretty much the same thing. You end up with the same net result. I, um, I've basically got two computers that I use. My laptop at home, which is which runs Hardy, and I've also got a, a spare system at work, which I use briefly throughout the day for... Um, that work-related stuff. Now, that's the one I normally put an alpha on. I just haven't had the time yet, although I'm going to do it on Monday because mm. I've, um, I'm working overnight. But um, currently, there's loads of stuff on it broken. On what? On, on It's hardy, but uh, it came from one of the first alphas, and I upgraded it through, as you just suggested. Mm-hmm. And there's loads of stuff broken on it, but my laptop works. So what I kind of stuff broken? Hardware problems or um, mainly video and audio actually? Mm. And I've not done anything about it because my laptop works. So the desktop yeah. should work, but it doesn't. And it's not that like I can't be bothered, but I don't think there's anything actually wrong. I'm sure there are situations mm. where something could be kicking around from an old old version, but you know, usually when you upgrade, you do a full upgrade from one release to another. It removes all the the old stuff and but, replaces it with new stuff. But it, 
does it do that when we go through the alpha process? Yeah, it's exactly the same process. Yeah. Okay. I mean, going from one release to another is not actually that different from going from today's updates to tomorrow's updates. There's not actually that much difference between the two. There's just I mean, a lot more updates. It's just a lot more packages. It's still just installing Debian packages. It's just lots more of them with lots more dependencies and a few removals and a bit of tidying up. But technically, it's exactly the same thing. It sounds like it log- logically should work. It just sounds scary, like as if what, it didn't uh, work. Not do a fresh install sounds yeah. scary. Like yeah, just, I, just knowing computers. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Why do? Why do? I mean, I've heard this a lot, and I've seen people. Oh, I always do a fresh install after a new release. I, I don't know where that that um that mentality comes from. Where well, what's the rationale? No, I don't know. I tend to do in situ upgrades um, between major releases, but I suppose if I was running pre-release then the dual boot thing seems to make sense or running it from a live CD because you, it is pre-release code. It's known to have bugs and it's known to be unstable. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be running that as my main desktop. So I suppose really I should be running dual boot or you know, with an external hard drive or something. Well, yeah. What I should do is change my boot order on my machine so that it boots directly into the development version mm. to try and force me to use it a bit more often because at the moment it boots into Hardy and I end up just using it because I, you know, I'm not... I'm not remembering that there's a, actually a development version on here. But um, yeah, why should we actually go through all the hassle of potentially broken software actually installing the alpha? Why not just wait until it gets released? Well, you can. I mean, there's plenty of people out there who do that, and they're called users. Sure. Yeah, well, we're all users in a way, aren't we? Yeah, we are. So that's exactly my point. You could do that. But one of the things we always try and impress on poor people is that this free software thing you can contribute to and one of the great ways you can contribute is file bugs comment on bugs you know help fix bugs in the code before it becomes a release that end users are going to have who aren't going to have quite as much experience to be able to diagnose a problem and file a bug and to be fair the free software wouldn't happen if people didn't do that yeah we yeah we we would spiral <laughs> downwards into a you know disappear into nothing if nobody ever ran development versions of code. I suppose it's a great way to ensure that your crucial application is working and supported properly in the next release. If, you know, if there's something you really rely on, you can't bear to be without, test it in advance. Make it a dual boot, then you can be sure that it will work when you do the upgrade. Yeah, contact the vendor of if if it's a third party product, mm. contact the vendor of that third party product and say, you know, there's a new version of Ubuntu coming out. Mm. It's using this kernel or, you know, this version of X or whatever it is that the the dependency is and say, you know, can you make sure your stuff works with it? But e- even a, an open source app, a packaged application in the repositories, if you rely on it a lot, you know, you want to find out how it'll change rather than just doing an upgrade and going, "Oh my goodness, this application is totally different now." Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the problems we have to contend with. Every time there's a release, there's loads of reviews of that release. And often those reviews are by people who haven't contributed at all throughout the six-month cycle of that of that product. And so they come in at the point of being a user and argue that from a user's point of view, this stuff should work and I shouldn't have to file bugs and I shouldn't have to faff about with a command line. I shouldn't have to edit text files. It all should work. But it won't work if you don't help for the six months before that comes out. No, but these are review journalists and they shouldn't have to do the testing beforehand. I know what you're saying, I know what you mean, but they're perfectly right. They're just reviewing a piece of software. They're reviewing a released version of the piece of software, yeah, yeah. but there's no there's no reason to exclude them from being part of the development process. There's no you don't you don't get there's no get out of jail free card with free software that says I'm excluded from helping out for the six months before this product is released. Just because you're reviewing it. Yeah, you're right in a review. But it doesn't exclude you. No, it doesn't exclude them. But that's not why they're writing the review. They're writing the review to see what it's like when it's released so that people can use it. Yeah, and there's nothing in free software that says you have to be involved in a community of a project to be able to use it. That will be non-free software. I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying it helps if you are. I'm sure it does. But, you know, I'd rather... Everybody in the world used Ubuntu and only 1% of them uh, contributed back than 1% of the world used Ubuntu. It's a bit like everybody using free, free software or not at all. I'm, I'm not convinced. The, the, the further that free software get, uh, and Ubuntu gets distributed, proportionally, I think fewer people will uh, contribute. Because there are people, people who get it on a, uh, an ultra portable or something like that who just will just use it, hopefully. And that's great. That's what we want people to do is just be able to use free software. 
they're unlikely to sort of sit and create a launch pad ID and, and file a bug if they do find a bug because they're probably just consumers. Yeah, that's, that's kind of why I asked the question, actually, because maybe we focus on the wrong thing with alphas, being the sort of the champion of the users. <laughs> um, alphas is all about filing bugs. Well, actually, shouldn't alphas be about getting the latest possible releases and, you know, with the, with the latest functionality and the shiniest software um, and, and giving that to the users and saying, hey, you know, this is where we're going. Have a look at this. It'll be fine. If there is anything wrong, then sure, you can deal with it if you feel up to it. But at the moment, alpha seem to be about fixing bugs rather than getting the latest software. Alpha generally means that there are a lot of bugs. Yeah. In, indeed, absolutely. Um, and that, that applies for the whole of the six months before it before it's... Yeah, it's, okay, there's a part early on in the in the release cycle where Ubuntu is synchronized with Debian. So at that point, there's lots of new crack in in the repository and a lot of it is broken. Yep. And then you go through the alpha stage where people try stuff out and it's still really badly broken and it's not a good idea to run it as a standard desktop or laptop because, you know, chances are stuff will break and your desktop won't work and the graphic driver will fail and you'll be left with a command line and that's not very nice for a user to experience. And then you go through the beta where probably find that you know it does kind of work and you're going to get less of those issues and then you know finally towards the release you can probably be quite confident that it's going to work at what point should a user get involved early on when it's going to break and they're going to get dumped at a command line beta stage where it might work but there still might be a problem or after it's released in terms of this upcoming release when does the beta part start so the betas start at the beginning of october so there's a month of betas before release at the end of october so this is really a really good time for people to get involved, download the alpha, and make sure that any bugs that they come across are filed. And then chase them through the betas. Carry on through that process. Well, yeah, absolutely. They just file the bugs and then hope that after the release it's all fixed. Yeah, you, 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 you get the beta, you check that it has been fixed, and if it hasn't, you go, wait, still an issue in beta whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just think we need to try and get people more involved early on in that process. Sure. But I don't think you're going to do that by focusing on the negativity of being it broken, and you're going to, you know, download this to fi- to file bugs. Yeah, but you can't you can't expect people to think that it's going to be the positive side. That hey, this is great new crack, but actually, you know, but it may not work on your system. Yeah, but what do you say to people when they take it home and it doesn't work? And they're like, oh, that's rubbish. Throw it in the bin. Well, I think it's just down to education, right? To be honest, perspective. Yeah. So yeah, sure. gla- glass half full. And this is really really great free software. And if you get a command line, that's great too. It is. And if you're, it is. We and love if you're, the command line. And if your kernel panics, that's just great. That's really fantastic Look software. It, it panics really it's, prettily. It's yeah. really cute. Yeah, it doesn't go blue or it's anything silly all. like that. Panicky. Woo-hoo, I'm a panic. It, is that how we do positiveness on this? It's, yeah, that's right. Excellent. One thing, as more people take up Ubuntu, you'll get more um, big companies um, possibly getting involved at the alpha level and doing formal testing so that, okay, as you get uh, more users you get a smaller proportion of them actually being involved in the alphas and betas on the other hand as it gets more ubiquitous we're going to get more big companies possibly doing that formal testing for them what so it departments and testing teams trying this stuff out no like dell before they stick it on their laptops right oems not not necessarily users um well their users are you know users. it departments may do if they're going to be supporting it they might it's possibly in their interest to especially if it's for a particular set of laptops or whatever. So if you want to get hold of uh, a copy of the beta version or when it comes out, or even the alpha versions now, you go to cdimages.ubuntu.com and you'll find the ISO images on cdimages.ubuntu.com. I shall do that on Monday. We've had some feedback. One quick update was from Silvio Sisto, who tells us that the support with the Best Buy CD we talked about in the last episode is actually from ValueSoft, not from Canonical directly. So you don't get to talk to... Oh, you can't talk to Kurt Von Schnitzel. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, I'm sure they have lovely people at ValueSoft. I'm sure they do. Maybe we should talk to someone from ValueSoft about their support. Okay, we'll try and get hold of somebody. Yeah, that'd be good. Alastair McKinley emailed in to say that he loved the fact that in the background of the Samba interview, we had Highland Cathedral playing, which I think is some bagpipe music or something like that. For the Philistine non-Scots amongst us, yes. Yeah, some haggish-related activity. Um, we should say it wasn't planned, it was just going on in the main stage when we were recording it. No, so. we have orchestras in the background playing our theme tune. Uh, J- Jeremy Allison does, we can't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> Alfred Newtile says, thanks for the film podcast and keep up the good work. Thanks very much. Cheers. 
Ken Fallon's been uh, listening since the first episode and uh, enjoys it. But he's, uh, in his email, he said that uh, Miss Marple called and she wants her podcast theme back. Swine, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> we love our music. We also had um, quite a lengthy discussion via IRC with uh, some listeners about um, the language we use on the show and whether we should swear or not and the fact that we don't and whether it's a, a conscious effort. And um, I just wanted to see what you guys felt about that because we've always said we wouldn't. And I just wondered if you know you guys agree with that and we're okay carrying on doing what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, it is a conscious effort. And I you have to try really hard. I do sometimes swear in real life. I hate to sort of you know give away all of our secrets. Yeah. Um, but we want people to be able to listen to the show in the car. Perhaps you know, we've had people email in say this is great because I can listen to the show when I'm driving my kids to school or going on holiday, whatever. Well, and this, I don't need to worry about effing and jeffing all over the place. This is one of the points that I raised was people want to be able to listen with their kids, and the comeback was who listens to podcasts with their children. And, I, you know, I'm not saying let's all sit around the fire like in the 1930s and listen to the wireless. I'm not saying that's it's what I, I'm it's expecting. It's the music. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might be forgiven for thinking that's what we want you to do. Yeah. But, no, it's, you know, it's the fact that if it was on, you know, playing on your laptop and you're in the den and kids come in, there's no problem that you don't have to turn it down or turn it off because they're around. That's more why we do it, isn't it? Yeah, and I think we see ourselves as part of the Ubuntu community. And if people came across the podcast as a result of looking for Ubuntu stuff, they we wouldn't want to be them to download a show full of swearing and think it somehow represented what Ubuntu was all about. I can see the argument that that swearing isn't really you know it happens in normal life, in normal discourse for a lot of people. So why why should we not just you know talk like people normally do? I guess it's because we're the Radio 4 of Ubuntu podcasts. Yeah, who was it that said that? It was Zalior, yeah, it was, wasn't yeah. it, from Lug Radio? Darren said, Rimron. Yes, he said, we are the Radio 4 equivalent of Lug Radio, which okay. I, think, I think is a compliment. Other yeah. people have said that as well, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just don't think it's necessary. Okay. I mean, the, one of the points that was put was it's a way of emphasising a point you know, and, and I've tried to express, you know, I, I'm, I am in agreement with you. I think we, we should not swear on the show. And if we, if someone does, if a guest does, or one of us accidentally does, then we bleep it. I, mean, I like to think I can express myself reasonably clearly without having to resort to swearing. And if I can't, and the only way I can make my point is to F and Jeff about it, then I probably need to reconsider what I'm saying. I agree. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or you can leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. You can follow us on Identica via identity.ca slash UUPC or via our Twitter feed, which is uh, twitter.com slash UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash ubuntu-uk channel on the Freenode IRC network. We welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews, rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. Thanks also to our network of mirrors who make it possible for us to bring the show to you. Uh, Showmedo.com, bitfolk.com and our other community mirrors hosted by Nafalo and James. That's all for this episode. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.